Good morning. Uh, today and the day after tomorrow, I'm going to discuss uh, economic developments in China before the reform and opening of 1978. Before I start, let me go back to part of what I discussed in my introduction. As I said, economy concerns meeting the material needs of the society, which involves producing and distributing goods and services. How are the productive and the distributive activities organized? In modern societies, the key roles are played by two agents, state and market. Depending on the relative significance of the roles played by the state and the market, the economic system can be classified ideotypically into four categories. Depending on the different economic systems, the development strategy also tends to be different. In the capitalist or liberal view of development, an economy can develop most rapidly if every person is able to pursue his own self-interest in competitive markets without undue interference from government. Progress is best promoted not by government, but by entrepreneurs owning the means of production, whose activities, guided by the profit motives, reflect the consumers' demand for various goods and services. So to make money, you have to produce goods and services that are demanded by the consumers. In this way, the economy develops. This is the worldview held by liberals. When the individuals pursue their self-interest uh, to their best, best, then as if guided by an invisible hand, they contribute to the public interest and economic development. Mao's view of development, which underpinned China's socialist development, was quite distinct from the liberal view we just have seen. Economic development occurs within the context of central planning. He's a socialist after all. Public ownership of industries and agricultural cooperatives or communes. The profit motive is officially discouraged from assuming an important role in the allocation of resources. Material incentives are downgraded. He emphasizes the moral incentives. He believes that selflessness and unity of purpose will release a huge reservoir of enthusiasm, energy, and creativity. He also downgraded specialization. He believed that economic development can best be promoted by breaking down specialization and by undermining other tendencies that give rise to exports, experts, technicians, and authorities. The elimination of specialization will not only increase workers and peasants' willingness to work hard for the various goals of the society, but also increase their ability to do so. The level of uh, material welfare of the populations 
should be raised only within the context of the development of uh, human beings and only on an egalitarian basis. Viewed in this way, the Cultural Revolution that started in 1966 had uh, long been in the making. If we take a bird's eye view of um, the Mao period, he implemented his view gradually by stages. He first won the political power, and then he reshaped the relations of production, uh, which included uh, uh, land reform and uh, creation of a mutual and aid and cooperatives. When this was completed, he tried to change forces of production by collectivization and rapid industrialization in the Great Leap Forward. And the Cultural Revolution was the last stage of a socialist uh, uh, transformation. Now let's uh, take a look how the economic strategy unfolded up to 1957. In 1949, uh, when the People's Republic of China was established, China was a poor and backward country. Uh, the modern industrial sector was small and uh, predominantly foreign-owned or foreigner-built. Uh, it was concentrated uh, uh, along the eastern seaboard and in Manchuria, which uh, uh, had been the virtual uh, puppet state uh, of Japan. Even that was mainly uh, mainly uh, light industry. Uh, although the uh, beginnings of heavy industry uh, existed. Uh, to make uh, matters worse, at the end of the World War II, uh, the industrial base in Manchuria had been looted by Soviet Union of more than $2 billion worth of machinery and uh, equipment. So anyway, in 1949, still output uh, uh, was uh, relatively small, uh, less than uh, 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 1 million ton. And the machine building industries were virtually non-existent. Uh, the transport system was uh, uh, inadequate. Uh, uh, the railroads were about 12,000 uh, miles, uh, but uh, given the size of the country, um, well, it, it uh, covered the very limited uh, uh, cities. Um, so uh, the railroad network was most extensive in uh, Manchuria, and uh, the railroads uh, the linked Manchuria uh, with the cities on the eastern seaboard. And the vast areas of the country were inaccessible uh, to uh, motor vehicles. Most uh, manufactured goods uh, in everyday use, still were made by traditional methods, either in home or uh, in very small handicraft uh, industries. About uh, uh, four fifths of the population uh, was in, uh, employed in agriculture, which provided the bulk of the national income. And uh, most of the rural population uh, were poor peasants. 
uh, at the time of um, land reform of 1949 to 1952, it was found that landlords and rich peasants uh, constituting less than 10% of the population uh, owned over 70% of the total uh, land. Uh, modern agricultural technology had not uh, reached uh, China yet. Uh, in any case, each adoption uh, would have been very difficult uh, for uh, two reasons. One was the uh, lands, arable lands were fragmented. Uh, uh, so uh, each peasant uh, ha held a very small uh, tract uh, of, of lands. Secondly, a uh, poor peasant lacked uh, uh, capital to uh, make investments in the modern agricultural technology. So, um, up per man and per acre were very low uh, in China. Landlords commonly took up to 50% of the crop on rent. Um, most uh, peasants had no chance to accumulate capital and many were permanently uh, in debt to money lenders uh, who were often also the landlords. Uh, they charged uh, extortionate uh, rates of interest. In summary, uh, at the time of um, the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1979, Chinese economy was predominantly feudal with enclaves of foreigner-built industries in the coastal cities and Manchuria. Uh, in addition to that, long uh, civil war uh, resulted in uh, rundown industry and uh, agricultural production also uh, was also reduced and the transportation system roads and railroads were uh, in uh, disrepair uh, therefore uh, the immediate uh, strategic objective uh, was a uh, rehabilitation of uh, national uh, economy um, and uh, rehabilitation uh, would lay the groundwork for the future socialist transformation of economy and society. During uh, this period, the economic control was secured over the uh, banking, trade, railroads, steel, and other uh, key industries. And uh, land reform redistributed the estates of landlords and uh, rich peasants. But neither in uh, agriculture nor in industry was there uh, any large scale uh, nationalization uh, at this time yet. Uh, there was uh, one exception. Uh, that was uh, the exception of uh, industrial assets belonging to the supporters of the uh, nationalists or Kuomintang uh, who were allied to foreign interests and uh, characterized as a bureaucrat capitalists as opposed to national capitalists whom the government uh, tolerated, as we shall see uh, in the film uh, later. Um, the national capitalists were uh, smaller businessmen uh, who had tried to build up independent uh, industry. 
they were looked on as a progressive force. And uh, they possessed uh, valuable skills which the regime could not do uh, without. Policy was not to expro expropriate them, uh, but um, gradually uh, assimilate them into a socialist uh, uh, sector. Many of uh, produced under contract to the state, and uh, by 1952, 22% of industry uh, by value was in this uh, position. Simultaneously, the government um, was setting up joint state private enterprises. Land reform uh began uh, before 1949 in the liberate, uh, liberated uh, areas and was uh, completed by 1952. Over 300 million peasants benefited uh, from the uh, redistribution. Um, so, um, China became a country of small owner cultivators. Uh, the ultimate uh, uh, goal of the regime uh, with respect to agriculture was uh, clear from the start. Uh, it was uh, the full uh, socialization and collectivization, yet um, yet neither the material uh, nor the political conditions uh, for this full socialization existed uh, during uh, this period. The material conditions uh, necessitated a high degree of uh, mechanization uh, scientific manpower and skilled and educated uh, labor force. Also, a high level of political and uh, uh, social uh, consciousness uh, would, ha would have been uh, necessary to enable the peasant to work collectively uh, instead of individually. For this reason, a gradual uh, approach was adopted. First, the government began to organize the so-called mutual aid teams. Uh, these teams consisted of five households uh, formed to compensate for shortage of manpower uh, draft animals and farm implements during the business um, uh, season. Uh, they developed into more advanced teams, uh, which consisted of up to 10 households, which held some property, such as tools and animals in common, and combined their efforts in farm farm uh, production and uh, subsidiary occupations uh, all the year round. Members uh, were uh, compensated according to their contribution and uh, they could uh, uh, withdraw if they wished, taking with them their share of the common uh, property. Uh, by 1952, uh, over 40% of households were members of uh, uh, such uh, teams. Now uh, let's turn to the first five-year uh, plan of 1953 to 1957. Uh, the aim of the first uh, five-year plan uh, was to lay the foundation of a comprehensive industrial structure 
as quickly as possible. Uh, priority of investment funds uh, that was over 50% was given to the capital goods uh, industry. The proportion of the state budget devoted to agriculture uh, was uh, relatively low at the 6.7%. Uh, the economic uh, strategy followed was uh, that pioneered by the Soviet uh, Union. So at that time, the slogan was learn from the Soviet Union. But uh, of course, uh, the, at the end of 1957, uh, Chinese uh, made uh, um, some uh, modification to the original uh, Soviet uh, model. Uh, so basically the change was uh, the central government, the state turned over control of consumer goods industries to provincial uh, governments. One notable thing about the um, uh, first five-year plan was that uh, China uh, financed uh, most of the capital investments. Of course, uh, when China started the uh, first five-year plan, Russia promised to build 300 industrial plants and training uh, which was worth uh, $3 billion uh, dollars, uh, during 1953 to 67. Of course, at, uh, later uh, the Soviet Union retracted the promise as a Sino-Soviet uh, ideological uh, split, uh, split widened. Uh, anyway, um, according to the official uh, statistics, uh, industrial uh, production in the plan period uh, increased uh, 128%. Uh, Although many believe that uh, the number was um, uh, exaggerated, uh, still, uh, they estimate that uh, industrial production increased uh, around 100% during the uh, five years. So it meant that uh, the economy uh, was growing uh, two digit uh, at the In agriculture, the strategy was to extend collectivization gradually by stages uh, developing from the mutual aid teams. Uh, the next stage was the development of uh, cooperatives in 1955 to 56. The movement toward the cooperative uh, advanced slowly, but uh, speeded up in the latter half of 1955 uh, after uh, <clears throat> Mao Zedong uh, uh, intervened with the publication of On the Question of Agriculture, Agricultural Cooperation. Basically, uh, Mao was afraid of uh, a reversion to capitalist um, uh, agriculture. So uh, he wrote, the spontaneous forces of capitalism have been already growing in countryside in recent years, with new rich peasants springing up uh, everywhere, and uh, many well-to-do middle peasants are striving to become rich peasants. On the other hand, many poor peasants are still living in poverty. There were uh, two kinds of cooperatives. Uh, the lower cooperatives consisted of 22 40 households 
uh, high, uh, uh, while higher cooperatives formed by merging uh, lower cooperatives consisted of 100 to 300 uh, households. Why uh, did the government uh, pursue uh, cooperatives? Why did it uh, try to uh, transform uh, mutual aid teams into cooperatives? Uh, it was because the government uh, assumed there were certain uh, advantages of cooperatives, uh, better utilization of labor, greater saving and uh, investment uh, potential, more rational use of uh, physical resources, and uh, better social welfare uh, provision. But uh, there were uh, uh, potential problems uh, in uh, creating uh, cooperatives. Uh, well, when you build, uh, uh, transform the mutual aid uh, the teams uh, into cooperatives, uh, the size, the number of the households uh, included increased dramatically. So, um, uh, Cooperativization increased the complexity of uh, management. Uh, and this was not a simple matter uh, considering the high illiteracy uh, in China at the time. And uh, the other potential problem was uh, um, peasants may lose uh, incentive to work for and uh, with the uh, larger groups. So how did the Chinese government uh, solve the problem? Uh, for the um, complexity of management, uh, the government um, uh, started uh, adult uh, literacy and education uh, program that uh, would eventually uh, contribute to more efficient management of cooperatives. And um, although uh, emphasis was on moral uh, incentives, the government spiced the moral incentives with the, some uh, material uh, uh, incentives. On joining cooperatives, the peasants were allowed to keep small private plots on which they could produce for themselves and for free market. And their share of the net income of the cooperative was uh, assessed on the basis uh, of uh, work points uh, accumulated, uh, which were determined by the extent and the arduousness of the work put in by each uh, member. Anyway, uh, according to the uh, official uh, statistics, during the plan period, there was a 9% increase in per capita food production. Uh, it, it's 1.5% uh, annual growth. And um, collectivization of agriculture uh, was carried through. Uh, agricultural growth of uh, the 1.5% uh, annual growth uh, may not sound a big thing, but considering the Less than 7% of state budget was used for agriculture. Uh, this was not a small uh, achievement. Mao's thought and the mass line were to be the foundation for a purer, fairer, more progressive Marxist state than the one that had emerged in the Soviet Union. It 
was to be a revolution in which the peasants were to take the leading role. Activists would explain the ideas of class identity and class struggle to every village and workplace and incite the peasants to speak up against the enemy. Chinese were now bombarded with propaganda. Traveling projection teams took films to the remotest areas, bringing the message of active socialism. As the revolutionary program started, the peasants were the first to benefit. They were granted the land reform they'd wanted for so long. It was the party's plan that they should seem to make the change themselves. In a pattern that would be repeated again and again, speak bitterness meetings were staged. Ritual dramas in which the landlords and others linked to the defeated nationalists were confronted. We were told to get together and ask the landlords to return land to us. We stated how much they should return and how they should return it. There was a denunciation meeting every day. Local party secretary Luo Shifa helped whip up feeling in his village. The first thing we had to do was to bring down the landlords. What we did was to persuade the tenant farmers to denounce them. At the public meeting, they would explain that they couldn't afford to pay back the rent every year, or they had to take out high interest loans to pay it off. People around the stage sympathized with the poor peasant's stories and they'd weep. Hundreds of thousands were killed. The class warfare was less vicious in the cities. The communists tried to win the support of the managers and technicians the revolution needed to keep the mills and plants running and to assimilate the capitalist owners who had not left with the nationalists. Propaganda showed businessmen handing the deeds of their companies over to the state and then celebrating with improbable glee the new socialist dawn. Zhong Guodong, district party secretary, heard what was really happening. By day they pretended to support the party. But at night, behind closed doors, they gathered their families round them and cried, bemoaning the fact that everything they'd worked for would soon be lost. When we realized this, we decided to recruit capitalists who sympathized with the party. The Jin family in Shanghai decided it was best to cooperate. Mrs. Jin took part in a film explaining her new outlook to other wives. After liberation, the communists didn't like businesses like my husband, so he was in trouble. Then we studied the party's policies and decided that joint ownership with the state was the only solution. But for those who resisted, 
the changeover could be bloody. Qi Youyi worked at a Beijing factory. The big bosses in our factory were executed immediately. The less important ones were forced to reform through hard labor. We were asked to keep an eye on them. We hated them so much, we beat them if they didn't work hard enough. That's the way they treated us. In the past, they'd been the masters, now we were. Women were given new rights at work and in marriage. The painful tradition of foot binding was abolished. And women were helped in the drive to end illiteracy. Gao Yuying from a village near Beijing was first a pupil and then a teacher. Once I'd learned how, I could teach others to read. I didn't have a blackboard, so I used a wooden door. I wrote words on it and they copied them. Some of them had their babies with them, breastfeeding and studying at the same time. I can tell you it was really hard. To clean up China's dirt and disease, the communists launched mass campaigns and expected everyone to take part. Propaganda films were used to set the pace. Millions were inoculated against the epidemic diseases that had racked China. War was waged on old habits. The pressure was inescapable. Party activists checked up on their neighbor's housework. Shen Fuqin from the local street committee went from house to house. We used to say, do you love your country? The country is calling on you to carry out the public health campaign. Get on with it. When they heard this, people said, oh, if we don't do it well, that means we don't love our country. We used to go up the lane to check on people's housework, to see if they'd done it properly. We'd examine the tables to see if they were dusty. If everything was neat and tidy, that'd be fine. If not, I'd tell the woman to do better. We cleaned the alley and put up posters. One said everyone must help to exterminate the four pests. Nothing escaped attention.
one of the four official pests was the sparrow. The small birds were accused of devouring the crops. The word came down from above to mobilize the people to kill the sparrows. Villagers of all ages joined in. We were so busy we even had to take it in turns to eat. The trees were really high and hard to shake. But everyone did their best, so the sparrows couldn't land. We used catapults. Some people used guns. Whoever killed the most sparrows was praised and given rewards. Those who caught fewer were criticized and encouraged to do better the next day. In fact, the campaign rebounded. With the sparrows gone, more insects survived to strip the crops. The same effort to get mass participation was applied to another type of cleansing, of incorrect thoughts. People were asked to look out for neighbors or fellow workers who seemed to meet the party's description of rightists or capitalist roaders or counter-revolutionaries and who were denounced. <laughs> 